Okay, I got the go from our technical support and offline um, off camera team here. Um, before we start, first things first, we have um, simultaneous interpretation here. So um, you can choose which language you would like to uh, or you prefer. Um, if you click on the globe symbol down here. Yeah. Um, Saya ingin menyampaikan kembali apa yang sudah disampaikan oleh Ratwa. Selamat datang di webinar. Uh, jika sahabat ingin mendengarkan dalam bahasa Indonesia, kita menyediakan penyelesaian. Well, so, if you like to listen to Indonesian, you can click on the globe and then you can actually switch into the language that you would like to listen to. You can actually choose yourself which language you would like to listen to. So please click onto the globe, which you can find on the button, and then you can switch to English if you like. Okay. Ich hoffe, alle haben sich eingerichtet. I hope everyone has set up. And we can start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone joining us today in the opening and first session of Decolonizing Aid, Planetary Solidarity Beyond Aid. My name is Radu Achele de Brahim, the speaker for Transformative Aid and Emergency Relief here at Medico International. As an aid and human rights organization emerging in 1968 from the solidarity movements, we have been always having a critical stance towards aid criticizing, defending, and abolishing it. Abolishing it in solidarity by co-creating a world where aid is no longer needed. A world in which everyone and everything can enjoy a good life. And yet, such a world seems far away. In the interwovenness of the crises we are living in today, the climate crisis, the crisis of capitalism with debt and the historical continuity of exploitation at its center, the further ongoing militarization of geopolitical and hegemonic contestations, resulting in violence, hunger, devastation, the hardening of borders and pushbacks and millions of displaced people, aid remains an essential part of the way the world is thought and made. Medical International, has long argued that aid must be grounded in a concept of power, space, and political economy. Otherwise, it can at best cushion the suffering of a given situation as efficiently as possible with diminishing resources. At the same time, aid can be complicit in that suffering. Three pictures. We are at the remote village Hajj Muhammad in Garissa, Kenya, with our partners Sudeka. The people here are marginalized and are facing drought, hunger, and negligence by the state. There are food sacks with the logo of a major international aid organization in the middle of the village. We ask why nobody takes any of it? Why is it standing there? The answer is sobering. The sacks contain beans and millet, food that is difficult to prepare under the circumstances and that is not part of what the communities usually eat. They will therefore repackage and sell it. Picture freeze. Another one. We are visiting our partners UNAC in Mozambique. The peasants show us the rotten GMO seeds they got from aid organizations after the devastating cyclone Idai in 2019. 
seeds that live two years, the duration of the project. The soil is after that difficult to cultivate in a country that is facing massive hunger. Picture freeze. Another one. After the atrocities against the Ovaherero and Nama people, decades of invisibilizing their pain, life, exploitation, and deaths, only in May 2021 did Germany officially recognize the atrocities of its colonial era in Namibia. With no sincere apology, Germany wants to pay 1.1 milliard euros over 30 years as aid to the country. The arrogance of atrocity. Reparations, not aid, renegotiate now with the Nama and Ovaherero. A slogan raised by Sima Louis Per and her fellows only a couple of days ago in Berlin. Every day when I come to office, I see the massive Euro statue in Frankfurt's downtown. The shadow of the European Central Bank, one of the most important global fiscal institutions, lies on our building, since both are in the same district. Medico is at the heart of the global center, not only physically, but also historically and beyond. While we work from an understanding of solidarity, as you can already see from my job title, aid is an important cornerstone of our work. Critically, we navigate, navigate the world with, through and against it. Grounding it in a concept of power, space and political economy in the world as it is now, we need to ask the important questions. As we look towards a future of a good life for everyone and everything, on the horizon, maybe, of these crises, where is aid to be located? Can aid be part of the shift towards planetary solidarity or does it stand in its way? Questions our partner, the Institut Mosintuvo, as well as the Department Global South of the Goethe University of Frankfurt am Main are also asking. Grounding aid in a concept of power, space and political economy, we cannot oversee its colonial legacy and how it is intertwined in the continuation of a coloniality. At the same time, we hear the word decolonizing often these days. It might even have become a buzzword to some extent. A concept emptied of its radical potential, freed from its original history and actors, ready to be adapted in the sphere of neoliberal politics. To think and act from a decolonial legacy is more than just diversifying different spaces, giving access to disadvantaged groups, or reflecting the racist origins of different words. Decolonization is a radical questioning and restructuring of the current power order, both materially and symbolically. At the beginning, I said, a good life for everyone and everything seems far away, which I think is unfortunately a sober assessment. However, as Corinne Kumar writes, asking, we walk. We want to ask, and with firm steps, walk together towards a good life for everyone and everything. Before giving the floor to, um, for the opening words of our co-organizer, Leanne Gogali, um, I would like to thank my colleagues behind the scenes today, without whom this series would have not been able to see the light. I'd like to thank Hendrik Susarenka, Caroline Schäfer, Andrea Schult, and Lukas Schmidt. Thank you. The floor is yours, dear Leon, but we have to wait for a couple of seconds for the translation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to everyone. 
I would like to welcome all the friends coming to the seminar. I'm Lian Gongali. I'm the chairwoman and the director of the Mosentovo Institute. The Mosentovo Institute is an NGO in the Poso district in Indonesia. There are several reasons why we are why we are having this organization as grassroots organization. It was founded in 2009. And one of the reasons is the official discourse that we have right now, because there has been a violent conflict, which can only be considered to be an interfaith conflict. And the aid, which was actually delivered was quite unfortunate. There were negative side effects of this aid. For instance, the population on site was only seen as a group or a group of humans, which doesn't have any power, which doesn't have any strength or the ability to act themselves. And at the same time, the traditional knowledge of the people was not recognized. The people was considered to having no knowledge, no expertise at all. So the community was told that they would have to change their knowledge. They had to learn new mechanisms. They had to gain new skills and expertise. And the traditional knowledge was actually neglected. And it was considered to be something to be overcome. And this led to a situation where we wanted to follow a different approach. And that is why we made sure that the communities could cooperate. So we were looking for some type of aid, which can be used in such a way that it is beneficial for the community, for the local community, that it is strengthening the local community. After the violent conflict, there were also natural disasters in our region. And in that regard, we actually met Medical International. We built up a um, community kitchen and we are co cooperated with the people, with the community, because we didn't consider them to only be victims or survivors. We wanted them to be the power to overcome the crisis. In Poso, during this time, we were rethinking these mechanisms of aid. And together with Medical International, we talked to the different colleagues and we also supported um, local youth communities and groups of young adults so that they can also come up with programs and grassroots projects for the time after the crisis. Another, um, or we also criticized the type of aid that we received. We wanted to give the people in postal space to think about aid and to also think about what they could do, which activities they could do. It was also very important to also reflect on the development discourse and to question this debate critically. We wanted to ask the question, what are people doing? For instance, in our district here, we have hydrogen power plants. And these hydrogen power plants are presented to be something which is renewable energy and which is very beneficial. And we, however, we saw that uh, there was flooding in the villages and that the ecosystem was destroyed. So we were able to see that the Lake Poso was actually exploited for this plant. And this plant is actually used for the mining industry, for the production of nickel and for the production of uh, batteries for electric cars. 
people try to convince to build this hydropower plant. Um, they wanted to convince them that it is good because uh, they said that they want to build new infrastructure and new roads and that this would be beneficial for the economy and the community. However, the destruction of the environment and the loss of jobs and the destruction of our culture is also the negative side effect. We see right now that we have to cooperate. There has to be a cooperation between the local community because they know what is going on locally. We see that nature and the local community are being exploited. This is a capitalist exploitation, and the community of Pozo is neglected. Their interests are not a priority in this project. That is why decolonizing aid is very important. And in our program, we need to talk about decolonizing aid. We want to address our questions, our issues, and it is very good that we now have this forum to discuss these questions on development and aid. So that together we can work on decolonizing aid together. Thank you very much. I think, Tanya, you can have the floor for your opening words as well. I would like to welcome all of us. Today, I represent the team of the University of Frankfurt. They are involved in this cooperation. It's an international cooperation. We are part of the Goethe University of the Sub-Department of Social Sciences. And our focus is on intersectional dimensions, North-South politics and South-South politics. And we have been using this collaboration for many, many years and are involved in Medico's project Denis Sima and Ine Eisenbrender are also here today. Uta Ruppert wanted to be here today, and I can only represent her. Unfortunately, she fell sick and she could not be here, but she conveys her greetings. What I would like to contribute to today's discussion is were well, part of our shared mindsets and our approach as a team. And in October, we had a seminar, Solidarity on Aid. And that is why my contribution to today's discussion shall come later. Uh, but it's not so much my own personal approach, it's a shared team approach. The team of the University of Frankfurt is delighted to be able to take part in this event. For around about a year, we have thought about ways of decolonizing aid, and we are so glad to be able to contribute. We have collaborated with Medico for quite some time, and it is based on our different approaches in the work we do. Medico's work is described as quite concrete, but bridging the gap between the practical approach and the theoretical deliberations. And this is part of our project, part of our research, and with that we can contribute to the dialogue. But beyond this dimension, we do not want to separate between practice and theory, we want to start in practice and work on that foundation. 
but we are different institutions and this is where we differ. We are so glad that Sima and Lian are here today to share with us their insights. There could not have been a better start for this event. And my contribution shall come later on, so I would like to pass the floor to Radwa. Thank you, dear uh, Lian, for your opening words. Um, thank you, dear Tanya, um, as well. I think um, we are all looking forward for the series and um, we shall have a really interesting and a fruitful conversation dialogue. And yes, we shall start with the first, um, first session um, today. We uh, ended our session um, development and aid in the master's house, unraveling the architecture and the imaginaries of the master's house. We want to discuss together and ask against the backdrop of uh, AIDS entanglement with capitalist and neoliberal models of development, as Lian already, um, yeah, kind of already said and described in her opening words, um, we want to ask how aid functions within the architecture um, of the manor or the hegemonic political structure and how this structure, uh, how this architecture shapes the practices of aid, its actors and institutions. Can we think aid beyond its effects on stabilizing existing structures of me and mechanisms of power and exploitation? How can we rethink uh, aid to realize social justice and solidarity? Our guest speaker today is Sima louis -Père. She is a human rights and uh, social change activist with a background in rural planning and regulation, project management and community development. She is the director of development planning at um, the Namibian Regional Council of Hardap. She is also Deputy Director of the NAMA Genesis Technical Committee, NTLA, and Chair of the Board of Directors, Riruwako Center of Gen for Genocide and Memory Studies. After we hear Simon Wipers' contribution, Lian Gogali will speak further elaborating on the indigenous endeavors on the Lake Pozo and how development aid and exploitation are linked together in Indonesia. Tanya Schattabauer will then have the floor for commenting briefly and opening the discussion. And then, dear guests, you will have the floor. This is a fishbowl discussion. Hence, there is a place for you on the panel. If you would like to contribute with a comment, a question, or another format of your choice, you can click on the hand symbol. You will then be asked by our off scene moderators if you would like to join per camera or only per your voice, hence audio. They will then, at the given time, give you the technical possibility to join. When you begin to speak, please say in which language you will speak so that our interpreters can arrange themselves. It would be best if you can speak through a headset microphone so that they have, we have a good quality for the translation. Also, I want to remind everyone, including myself, <laughs> to not speak fast um, so that everything is translated. You can already raise your hands uh, during the contributions, and we are very much looking forward to our discussion. discussion. You can also, of course, uh, write your point, comment a question in the chat. We would love, however, to have a more lively discussion through the fishbowl format. I'd also like to remind you that this event is recorded. With that, I will now give the floor to you, dear Sima. Uh, okay, is, is that to me now? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Radwa, um, for having me. Thank you for um, asking me to, to be um, on this platform and, and to join the, the audience. Um, 
if you allow me, I would like to contextualize a little bit the matter that is under discussion within sort of the historical, you know, backdrop of the German colonial period in what was then known as German Southwest Africa. And also the recent foreign re relations dramas, to me, it seems more like a drama, <laughs> really than uh, more than achieving anything between the German and the Namibian governments. Um, the recent events in Namibia and German foreign relations have definitely exposed contemporary global dynamics of power and um, of, of you know, the past of violence and more so also the idea of masterdom and servitude. Um, it is actually quite painfully funny in a way. I would, have, I would never have thought that a piece of paper written in my lifetime um, between two governments could be so violent um, and so racist as the initial joint declaration between the Namibian and the German governments. Um, maybe just for some background information for the audience, Germany committed genocide um, during its entire colonial rule in present day Namibia. Um, today, the genocide is referred to as, you know, the 1904 to 1908 genocide. However, the way I see it, uh, um, genocide doesn't happen overnight. It is something that is planned and it is executed with, with precision. And that precision was sealed um, in 1884 with the Berlin Conference, which carved up Africa and made Africa the possession of Europe um, without the permission of Africans. Um, between the period 1884 to 1893, the German emperor sent its highest military officers to subdue the Nama and the Ovaherero nations um, in order for Germany to claim its so-called highest place in the world order um, of the human race. By 1893, Germany got so fed up with the resistance of the native Nama and Ovaherero people that it sent a gentleman called Kurt von Francois to seal its power um, over the native Nama and the Ovaherero people. And on the 12th of April in 1893, Francois ordered his troops to attack the Nama Vatboy stronghold at Warrenkrantz in central Namibia. And on this mission, he specifically said, and I quote, um, the purpose of this mission is to annihilate the Vatboy tribe, unquote. Um, and this specific tribe had until then refused to accept German protection. Um, I find it quite curious that Germany would want to protect the Nama people. And I'm also not quite sure um, whom, they were, you know, whom they were supposed to be protected against. But uh, nonetheless, this order by Francois marked the first order of annihilation against an entire collective of people. Um, who had until then resisted foreign occupation in Great Namakwaland. In October of 1904, after the Herero put up a pretty no-nonsense fight against invasion of their territory, uh, another German gentleman called Lothar von Trotta issued an extermination order against the collective community of the Oka Herero people. Um, when he was done with the Ovaherero, uh, Trota ordered another extermination order, um, not only this time against the Vitboy Nama, but against the entire Nama people. These orders of total extermination then concluded the determination of Germany to declare itself a superior race in the African territory of the Nama and the Ovaherero people. After the genocide, the German man, the German woman, and the German child became the master, having stripped the 
natives of basically everything. Political landscape of Namibia, the Nama and Ovahero people continue to remain outcasts in a modern democracy, which was essentially established by Western powers. And what we also saw after independence, um, with independence came a swarm of white European aid, um, which was coined bilateral development aid. And uh, Germany <laughs> was in the angels who once again came um, to guide the uncivilized Africans towards civilization. And you will see in the language of Germany, even today, you will see in the language of Germany how it brags about the development aid money it has poured um, seemingly like rain in the desert land of, of Namibia, forgetting what is actually stripped from specifically the land overhead and only remembering um, that it has some sort of superior duty to civilize the uncivilized. Um, today in Namibia, Germany uh, uh, remains the biggest uh, uh, aid, you know, aid giver uh, to the Namibian government because of what it calls a special relationship that it has with Namibia. Sorry, I got thrown out there for a minute. Am, am I still audible? You are audible, dear Sima, and you can see you now as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I was saying that, uh, yeah, Germany claims to have some sort of a special relationship with, with, with Namibia, uh, but it has, it has never you know what relationship is. Now, if I want to come back a little bit to the structural racism evident in the joint for some back in 2016, after years of pressure by the descendants of the Sorry, I keep uh, getting thrown out for some reason. Um, don't worry, Sima. Uh, we, we think that it might be the internet connection. So um, as unfortunate as it is, might you, uh, it, it might be better if you um, close your video. Okay. We will try again. And maybe also repeat your last two sentences. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, um, I wanted to now come back a little bit to the structural racism that is so glaringly evident in the joint declaration. Um, for some background in 2016, after years of pressure by the descendants of the Nama and Ovaherero people um, against whom genocide was committed, Germany started negotiations with the Namibian government. And this was, as Germany says it, um, to atone for what happened during its colonial era. The negotiations were clenched in a bilateral reconciliation deal between the two states. At this point, it only remains an initial document which has not been signed yet um, because it has largely been rejected by the Nama and the Ovaherero people. And in this document, a vague reference is made to genocide, um, stating that genocide, it can be considered genocide from today's perspective. Um, by saying that, it effectively means that killing savages at the time was legal, uh, um, was within their legal right to kill, because Germany is also uh, um, arguing this in its legal argument in the, in the New York court case. 
Now, if you look at the joint declaration, it is effectively a document that is meant to sort of sanitize murder committed during the German colonial period. Um, and that murder is softened as development aid to the Namibian government. Interestingly, the document has a consistent, almost verbal vomit of racism repeated over and over um, by all German politicians. It has become an aid document rather than a reparation document. And also something that I've noticed about this document um, and, and also every time that German politicians speak is that it, is, it has this excessive use of diplomatic jargon that is so inaccessible to any lay person and yet it is repeated by every German politician um, in some way of you know, trying to desperately look like a thought leader without actually saying anything that makes sense to anybody. Um, what I, what, I, what I find about this joint declaration is that it does not refer us to the process of sort of deconstructing colonial ideologies um, regarding the superiority and the privilege of Western thought and, and approaches. You know, getting out of your comfort zone, whether it's materially, whether it's emotionally, or even whether it's physically and following the lead of those who are impacted by violence and by injustice. It's just, that is simply nowhere to be seen um, in this document and also in the entire negotiation process between the, two, between the two governments. So it is literally an agreement which reaffirms Germany's superi su superiority and makes Namibia a beggar of, of, of foreign aid. You know, it's like dangling this carrot in front of these Africans um, that need to be somehow civilized. Um, yet, you know, in, in, in the German mainstream circles, And in fact, it also renews the coloniality of foreign aid. Um, so when I think about decoloniality, decoloniality, um, I think of a process that examines um, the matrix of power that emerged during and after the colonial period. Um, it should examine how these dynamics have lasting effects um, that, you know, this idea of privileging a Eurocentric conceptualization of the future um, from which uh, uh, marginalized groups are excluded. So if you look at the negotiation process between the German and Namibian governments, including the joint declaration, it is exclusively between two states which are not addressing the harms caused to the very people who have become marginal due to the actions of Germany during its colonial, during its colonial period. And uh, this matrix of power, you know, also includes the sort of privileging of whiteness. And so you see the sort of imperial gaze that is very much alive in German Namibian relationships um, where the Nama and the Ovaherero are sort of viewed through the lens of white ethnocentrism, um, which assumes that whiteness is the only, uh, you know, reference point for any type of progress. And Germany has finally found the solution for this Nama and Ovaherero problem. And um, I think that unfortunately, Germany has lost a unique opportunity through which it could uh, repair. You know, in, in, in its declaration, it 
it, it, it shows how the modern day aid system um, can only be understood as a, as a form of, of re reparations for violence inflicted um, in the imperial past. And through this document, it is trying to neutralize, it is a deliberate neutralizing of the aid systems sort of violent past um, through this, you know, white gaze, through this imperial gaze. And yeah, so uh, Namibia as a, as a former colony has really been transformed into an object of development perceived as, you know, lacking the agency um, and in need of some sort of capacity building from, from Germany. And so um, in conclusion, for me, this case study of Namibia um, during this process of negotiation really shows to me how colonial Namibia still is, despite having gained independence more than 30 years ago. And yeah, the negotiations um, between Germany and Namibia are a painful lost opportunity um, through which Germany could have shown some genuine responsibility to face its colonial past. But in fact, it has just renewed, you know, and reaffirmed the, 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 the white gaze, the imperial gaze. Yeah, uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, dear Sima. Um, and now I would give, or Jan, you have the floor. Yeah, uh, terima kasih banyak, Sima. Thank you so much. These have been very interesting contributions. Thank you so much for this interesting description. Now, I will try to speak slowly. And please remind me in case I should speed up. What I would like to share with you has to do with our context at POSO in Sulawesi. in a region that has received aid through the Indonesian government and by foreign supporters. I would like to start with the following. I would like to shed light on the term development, which comes with a consequence, the term itself as a consequence for our ecosystem, for our economic system and the culture of our society. So using the term development is consequential and triggers certain imaginary constructs by those who use or by those who hear the term development. So using the term development is part of a linguistic system in Indonesia, for instance, the stories about poverty, the claim that the population needs to be empowered, which is an imagination coming from people who believe they are superior and rank more highly in the hierarchy of people. So the speaker has the power looking at a people that does not know the concept of self-determination or self-power when it comes to their own economic relations and social relationships. So the term development implies that, for instance, the existing cultures of the community or communities can be changed and that land can be used with a different purpose. So there is a development imagination that on the one hand implies 
poverty and on the other hand, the lack of power. And that has to do a lot with the values of capitalism. The indicator poverty in that language of development has to do with ownership, owning a motorbike, for instance, a TV set, a fridge, but does not pay attention to the relationships within the ecosystem or the land that is owned by those people. So the stories about poverty in Indonesia comes along with a practice that includes each and every village, even the smallest village, and has the power to change the relations within that given village. So it wants to implement a specific kind of development, telling people what to do. So the people or the peoples should do something that would ignore the voices of the grassroots movements. The stories about development is not telling us that it's actually the people of the grassroots movements to think about those structures. But they don't, or they actually think about their own environment, the ecosystem, the land, the water, whatever they find in their vicinity, in their environment. And the story about development gives a different nuance to how they tell stories about the structures and the communities. So the structure of development also is consequential for the term aid. And the term aid comes along with a socioeconomic and economic structure, harboring the risk of an unequal power situation by those receiving the aid in relation to those in power giving the aid. So the mechanisms of aid, the direction of aid, the purpose of aid is not linked to the receivers of aid. So those receiving aid cannot voice their concerns and have a say in all that. And that, of course, has consequences. For example, the people at Poso Lake have had to go through a conflict. And the term peace and the construction of peace is something they know. So everything exists within a context of peace and the development that is brought into this country is done in the region that was influenced by violence. Or in other words, this conflict is not seen in all its different aspects. It's only seen from that interfaith aspect, Christians, Muslims. And this is a very one-sided dialogue, but it does not include all other aspects. If we talk about tolerance, for instance, in this context, and if we listen to the stories about development and stories about aid, then they enrich each other But they all are done within this capitalist ecosystem. And when we say that Poso is a region where there was an interfaith conflict, 
then aspects of security take center stage. Even if we say this is a region where there is terrorism, where there are active terrorists, then we include an aspect of militarism, a military aspect, which of course influences aid and all the development projects because they are done in line with the fighting of terrorism and the construction of peace on an interface foundation without considering the entire community. They do not talk about jobs, for instance. They talk about security. They say because of security reasons, communities on the ground must not work on their plantations or orchards because they're not allowed to go there. So this is the context in which all of that is evolving. And these alleged reasons legitimize an existing power system based on exploitation and bans. And that is why we believe it's necessary to take a look at the language to begin with and how this linguistic system works, which we need to overcome. And how this linguistic system is linked up with the economic exploitation of the region and the power systems. When we worked with the language, we first chose the term of empowerment. This was the term we embraced because we saw that this is where a legitima legitimization took place. It's within the framework of the measures that companies were located, were established to create jobs. But these were foreign companies creating jobs in the region. But, was, but what was taking place was that water and land was controlled by the companies and no longer controlled by the local communities. That means investigating language is very important to us. So let's talk about the linguistic entanglements in the POSA region. It also means that we need to interpret the words. We need to define the language that we would like to speak. So we are now using a language that is close to the people that reflects the social and cultural aspects. For instance, within the framework of labor, jobs, so for instance, is a term, is a word in our language. And that means we are enriching each other. So we can strengthen each other. So it's not only empowerment, it's strengthening each other. And the fact that we are strengthening each other, not just on a human dimension, but also when it comes to the relationship, humankind environment. We also deconstruct the term creative economy. We use this for development coming from the government without considering nature and the environment. They only take a look at 
humankind, but they do not consider humankind in their relation to the environment and nature. So we want to focus on our ecosystem and by doing so, furthering development to bring it to the next level. This is what I wanted to share and I thank you so much for listening. Thank you, dear Lian. Um, dear Tanya, now you have the possibility to comment um, briefly and open the discussion. Um, I see that uh, Sima has left us. Uh, the connection, I think the connection broke. So um, I hope she rejoins us soon. Is not there? Okay. Um, okay. No, uh, Sima is here. Uh, it's just that I did not, wasn't able to see her. So, Tanya, you can start. Wonderful. Well, it is my task to share a brief comment with you to shed light on the things we have in common, what those two perspectives have in common. I would like to thank Sima and Lian for their contributions and for sharing their perspectives. Thank you so much. You have different perspectives and we would like to bring them together. Both of you shed light on the colonial era, colonialism, and its central dilemma and how paradox it is. And this has been discussed by us critically for many years. It notes that the world is not suffering from too little aid, but that the aid is not given in line with the actual purposes and needs. And this has been our criticism, the criticism that we have of this aid development paradigm. So the architecture of aid and development is not what I would like to discuss now. I would rather like to discuss how aid can be given in a way that it is part of the necessities or is it actually an impediment to what should be done and what is necessary? When we talk about aid as a way of repatriation, then it shouldn't be done in this paradigm. And I believe this has become very clear by Sima's and also by Lian's words. The interpreter would like to say that the audio is breaking off. Um, Tanya? Um, so the interpreters would like you to maybe repeat your last two sentences. The audio was breaking. Du hast gehackt für einen Moment. Hackst eigentlich immer noch. The audio was breaking off. I'm so sorry. The internet doesn't seem to be very strong today. Well, what I was trying to say, or my last sentence actually, was about the question of how we see the role of aid or the necessary change in the world. And when we talk about help for restitution, then this should not be done within the paradigm of aid. It should not be worded within the paradigm of aid. It should be done within the paradigm of solidarity, only on the foundation of solidarity and mutual solidarity. It's not only 
be done within the framework of giving and taking, but mutual solidarity. And this is the relationship it should take into consideration. And I believe that both contributions talked about this. How can we interpret aid nowadays? And I believe to that end, it is important to make yourself aware of something both ladies talked about, namely that there are forms of resistance or the perception of aid as it was given. And that there are forms of self-organization that you are creating alternative spaces which are based on experience and this is what you focused on the role of knowledge of experience and this is always in contradiction to the knowledge claimed by the experts This is the knowledge that is being worded, that is being placed at the center. But if we want to decolonize aid, if we want to think about shaping aid in a different way, then it needs to be based on those self-organizational processes and experience. So that was the alternative space that I was referring to before. Now the interpreter would like the audience to know that the tone is breaking off. There is no audio. Tanya? Genau, es ist wieder passiert. It happened again. Yeah, genau. Uh, the very last sentence, Tanya, so, because you genau. were breaking off. Maybe you can repeat your last sentence. Vielleicht die letzte Frage, uh, die letzte, der letzte your last sentence, last sentence. If you could repeat that. If you could repeat that, that would be great. Genau, dann alles der Satz. Wenn man es gerade nicht braucht, ähm, passiert das. Ähm, tut mir furchtbar leid. Normal. I'm so sorry. Usually my internet connection is fine. What I said was actually that we need those foundations that the two ladies were referring to, these should be the foundations or should be the framework in which practices of solidarity can be developed. And it should be based on those self-organizational processes when creating those alternative spaces. And it should also be based on those experiences And I would like to go back to something the two of you said. You were referring to those fights that you fought yourselves, and it became clear, I believe, that, well, as Sima and Lian said, it became clear that these self-organizational processes are a sounding board for voices, that talk about the genocide, the resistance, the resistance to the capitalists dealing with survival, and that those voices created a space where those stories could be heard. This is your foundation, because you were referring to the resistance and the fights. I heard that in Lian Zensium's words, and it's not just national spaces, it's transnational spaces, because they consider the causes for these structural inequalities, be it in Indonesia or be it in Namibia, it puts the actual colonial past in the right framework. 
in the right context. And you refer to the coloniality of past that needs to be treated with. And without treating or dealing with this past, aid cannot be given as a purpose of restitution. It will not be efficient. It will never be efficient. And this is what we could see at the COP27, where they were negotiating climate measures and actions. It was as inefficient because they do not want to consider certain facts. And Leon talked about their cooperation with Medico and that it based it was based on those self-organizational processes within the community right from the start. And that this is an alternative space that was created in order to exchange that knowledge that is based on experience that goes beyond the development of criticism. And you could make it obvious that the Institute Mosentuvu and the other entities that you were referring to at the beginning, you mentioned those communal kitchens, that it is very important to create those alternative spaces in a self-organizational manner in order to, well, archive your own knowledge and your own expertise to be able to find your own language. So thank you so much for your words. And these are all spaces for evolvement where criticism can be voiced openly and where you can also give people the space they need to establish those forms of self-organizational processes and knowledge based on experience. So this is my essential argument, or my central reasoning, I'm sorry. If we want to have aid based on restitution, based on true justice, based on historical justice and action of solidarity, then we need to think about just that. And it needs to start at those forms, forms of self-organization, alternative spaces, and knowledge based on experience. And I can only hope that this helps us to restructure the colonial aid as it is being practiced here and there as we speak. But it's also about future projects that want to be shaped, but it can influence already existing ex actions and measures. This is the interpreter saying that the tone is breaking off. Exactly. You have to. Your sound is breaking repeat. off. Yes, your sound was breaking off. So if you can repeat interpreters, one or two sentences. I do not know where the sound was breaking off. But it was just a wrap up of my thoughts. Well, basically, I would like to repeat that we don't have to look at the future. It's about seeing those things that already exist based on solidarity 
actions that are based on solidarity, aid that is based on solidarity. This is what we can use as a foundation to further evolve those practices. So these are the things we should take a look at in order to not only criticize the architecture of aid, but to shape the architecture, the entire house. These are my final words. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, um, Sima, Lian, and Tanya. I think um, we have really uh, great, you know, great arguments that have been made. Um, looks in the past, looks to the future, and also in the present that is very precious. At the same time, um, it opened a lot of questions, and I, I am thinking a lot right now, really about what has been said and the connections, and at the same time also the contestations in that. Um, we have um, now the space for a uh, discussion. It would be great to have a fishbowl discussion, as I've mentioned before. This is a format where you can contribute as a speaker, also here, and um, discuss. We can discuss together, and then. It uh, kind of rotates um, for uh, participating in that form. You can click on the hand symbol down here in the middle. Um, and of course, what you can do is also pose your questions in the chat. And uh, until maybe you gather your thoughts as, as well as I am also still gathering mine, um, I would actually post, I would like, really like to post some questions as well. Um, so what I've also um, heard in the three contributions actually was at the same time, um, the idea or the argument that aid is not solidarity. And this is a really, uh, I think really important to um, to capture here. Aid is a form of power relation that is based on an unequal um, position and positionality. And solidarity is a process, as uh, Lian and uh, Sima and also Tanya at the end again uh, mentioned, a, solidarity, a process that is collective and that um, cannot but be uh, done in uh, collectivity, in contestation, in basically the um the the the, the, the yeah the different uh, inequalities at the end of the day uh and not by overseeing them and uh, by ignoring them that would be also a form of um further ongoing probably uh, yeah power relations and uh, exploitation in that um at the same time you mentioned as well the coloniality of the future. So how the future is already being colonized. Um, Lian, you mentioned um, how green, uh, the green economy or a green project are being already um, installed in Indonesia, the Lake Pozo um, in particular. Uh, Sima, you have spoken about the Namibian German relations and how they are manifesting in a future that is again, as uh, in your words, um, uh, yeah, modern day system of um, uh, yeah of of a whiteness of um, manner mannership and so on and so forth. So uh, I'm really asking: Can we in that already looking at that uh, question at uh, that future? Uh, can we think decolonial decolonial aid? Is can is this word still fitting? Is it suitable? Is it a possibility when we're thinking? Because as I hear you, I might I, I got rather the, the impression that you are saying aid cannot be decolonized. We have to actually overcome aid. We have to maybe abolish aid. Maybe you have to think a totally different perspective in that. And at the same time, Tanya, you, you made um again the point that you cannot uh yeah, you cannot untangle aid basically from the architecture of a uh, global hegemonic structure. So um, my question in, in that is actually um, where to start? You you said, yes, the, the language 
um, other Tanya, you said it's uh, or bundled together also the point that Lian and Sima were speaking about um, the collective spaces that are already there, the solidarity movements that are already there. And um, Sima, you said that it's about restructuring the whole idea of um, of the future, how we are seeing it. So I want to go further in that and ask you, how can we think solidarity in in the verge and in the merge of these crises that are made through the colonial and um, uh, yeah, colonial structures and built up on that and actually a, con a continuity of it, especially, and this is my last point, and then I'd really like to see if we have um, already questions or raised hands. So here a hint to the um, our off-camera moderators. Um, yeah, so my last point is, especially in a future where we see that a lot are uh, a lot of of, of um, progressive and emancipatory uh, politics, and I'm putting here it in quote unquote, because while we are having this uh, declaration with um, with Namibia, the German uh, foreign policy, for example, is declaring itself a feminist foreign policy. And we are speaking about uh, decoloniality now as a, as I said in, in the beginning in my opening, as a buzzword even, right? So um, how how can we navigate in that? I, I think it's a it's a really difficult task. Um, so yeah, this is this is my big question, <laughs> I guess. And um, before doing that, uh, or before uh, giving the floor, I would like to give you the possibility to raise your hands and join us here to yeah, have a fishbowl discussion. Okay, we um, will wait for like a couple of seconds and then we uh, Lucas, uh, here our off, um, in, in the off moderator till now, um, will let you enter. Uh, first of all, thank you to all the panelists for the very interesting inputs and insights uh, into the various contexts of thinking about, but also doing decolonization in and of aid. Um, we've collected some uh, hands that, that were raised, and we would like to start with Yael, who would uh, ask a question or make a comment. Um, yeah, you're welcome to speak, and yeah, you can very well speak in uh, German. Ah, yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, ich, uh, genau, also ich bin nicht sehr informiert über... Hi, über everyone. I'm not really informed about this topic, but I'm very interested in this topic, and that is why I'm so thankful about all these interesting and exciting insights into this huge topic. And during the UN climate conference, I actually was thinking a lot about these spaces that were addressed. We have to create these spaces, but how can we create these spaces on this global political level? where we can actually talk about all the different initiatives and all the possibilities that already exist and how things can be implemented in a global political level. Because you also need these powerful discussion participants in order to achieve change. And I just asked myself, 
how can this be achieved? Because I read a lot about the UN Climate Conference, the COP, and there were also climate activists from the Global South, and they were not given this space. And this is very frustrating. So I just asked myself how this can be done. How can this work? Do you have any perspectives on that? Thank you very much, dear Yael. Um, so maybe because there are two, I mean, I think both of our questions are quite near, right? Um, with different, so maybe uh, Lian and Sima and Tanya, you can already give us some points to get the discussion rolling. And then um, we have again contributions in the fishbowl. So let us do it like that. Who would like to start? Um, uh, Uta yeah, would I be can... the next one on our list. Oh, okay. Hello, everyone. I think it would be okay to answer the the first or to discuss the first two uh, questions first because mine, I think, is a bit different. Yeah, that was my. Yes, exactly. That that was the the idea. So um, it, it's great that you're ready. Uh, so um, Lian, Sima, Tanya, who would like to start? When you möchtet, starte ich. <laughs> if you like, I would like to get started. Und zwar also mit diesem, mit dieser Frage, so I would like to get back to the question how to create these spaces also within the global climate policies. I think this is a great example where we see these relationships because in this international group, it was also about the question of reparations and restitution. And I think during the COP, we were able to see that international politics is very institutionalized. I'm sorry, the sound is off again. So the historic recognition of guilt is very important. People need to accept the guilt. So the connection is back, I hope. Is it working again? Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know what you heard. So my point was, also here the question of restitution is something which is not really addressed by international politics and the international politicians do not really recognize their guilt. They don't want to accept their guilt. And this is actually what the climate justice movement does. They actually lower their expectation because they also say that the historical guilt is not being accepted. And this is also what Sima made very, very clear. The reparations are also connected to historical guilt. You need to analyze what happened. You need to repair the history. However, this cannot be expected from the top, this has to happen in self-organized alternative spaces. You have to find alternative political spaces for that. And the international community cannot really create this space. So I think the spaces need to be alternative spaces. They have to take place in alternative locations and places. I think the international community does not offer this solution. 
the solutions that we've seen so far are not real solutions or the real solutions to the questions that we have seen. Ian, Sima, would you like to um, react to those questions? Ian, would you like to um, react? to this question? Um, okay, ini singkat saja, karena saya bukan orang yang optimis dengan... Uh, I'm not an optimist. I'm not an optimist with regard to the meetings with rich countries when you talk about developing countries. These meetings are quite normal. They happen quite often and they always show this inequality. They reflect this inequality. So we cannot really be hopeful in terms of our expectations from other countries. And these are the countries that are actually destroying the environment and nature. They're actually hiding their guilt by organizing these meetings. They say that they want to provide money for disaster relief. However, the question is, how are these disasters uh, coming about? What is the reason for these disaster? We see that these countries are to blame. So for me, I have to say that I'm not an optimist. I don't trust these meetings, these appearances. We should not listen to these politicians on during these high-level meetings um, who want to show their supremacy, uh, supremacy. We need the local communities. We need local spaces where people can speak freely and present what the politics does. They can actually present what the impact is coming from this collision of politics. And we, we actually need this community space in the impacted countries. We don't need the decision makers on the high level. There's always space for the decision makers. However, there's not enough space for local communities. Yeah, I see Sima. Um, you, you also would like to react, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, this whole, this whole idea of aid um, implies somebody who gives and somebody who receives. And I think that is part of where the problem is. You know, I mean, aid for what? Why, why, why do a lot of um, Western countries feel obliged to give aid? Why, what, what is the root cause of that? It lies in coloniality. And I think in the, in the colonial period, and I think this is where we need to start. Um, you know, this whole idea of being this, uh, uh, being seen as these people 
who are coming to the rescue of other people when it is actually you know these rescuers that are the cause of the problem i think this is where we need to start um i've been going to germany quite often in the last few years and people are always asking me what can we do for you you know what what can we do for your fight how can we how can we support you in your fight and i'm always left wondering is it my fight or is it something that you know the ordinary german person needs to see what kind of the, what kind of a world does the ordinary german person want to see um does it want to see a world in which we are all equals do western powers see their former colonies and the people as human beings i've also wondered a lot about why is it that the german government is so afraid of talking directly to the nama and the overherero people because once it does that the nama and the overherero people will mirror back to the german government what actually happened and germany is not able to face that mirror it is not able to look at itself in the mirror because we will be that mirror and 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 therefore germany needs to deal with its with its guilt there there is an element of of guilt in this that and that guilt is the responsibility of germany to deal with it just as much as we need to to deal with a lot of issues and the other thing is you know you cannot aid has become sort of this cushion for you know sort of hiding behind what actually happened and what continues to happen it continues to happen today um and so there is no there is no repairing you cannot repair if you have not identified what you have hurt or what you have broken or the 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 the, the extent of the damage that you have done if you have not investigated that the extent of the damage then you cannot repair aid is like putting a bandage on a on a uh, on a wound where a venomous snake has bitten you you are not getting rid of the poison you are just putting a bandage over over the wound and that wound will fester and i think this is this is really where we need to to start i think also something that i've seen um in the whole um a discussion is how um you know professionals are brought in you know it's always this idea of there is someone else and it must be a white person who knows better than you so what we have seen in the joint declaration between namibia and germany is that germany and both or germany was the one who actually insisted on this uh that they will talk to the namibian government and then they said that the nama and overherero professionals can be attached to a public service you know professionals technocrats to 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 negotiate with the germans so it's like you know the the jd was to use nama and overherero professionals as a technical advisors and by using professionals Germany is trying to dissociate itself from its colonial legacy through an insistence on some sort of neutral form of professionalism and this professionalizing has had the effect of actually neutralizing or depoliticizing activism and social movements and this is something that we really need to need to think about and it is done it to the point that 
activists and movements working towards structural transformation are being considered radical because they are addressing the real issue. And what I've also seen is that the, there is like a local elite that is emerging um, um, and they are failing to, to challenge the structural colonialism in order to comfort the former colonial masters. And in so doing, um, you know, they, they, they try to maintain the power and the importance that is, that is given to them, that, you know, that should not be, be taken away, away from them. I think you, I think it's important that you need to talk to the people. If you don't talk to the people, you are not going to resolve anything. Nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever. Decision makers need to talk to the people and the people also need to talk to each other. And I, I, I'm, I'm seeing a common thread here and it's discrimination, it's racism. That is the common thread, regardless of where our, you know, of where we are, we are located um, regardless of, you know, how our different struggles look like or, you know, what they are about. It's about a racism that is based on a ex, ex, extracting, you know, capitalist uh, ideology. That is, that is what it is. I mean, part of the, part of the joint declaration of the implementation of the joint declaration is to start a green hydrogen project in Namibia in order to extract the resources of Namibia so that they can be uh, exported to Germany because Germany has got an energy crisis. So the joint declaration is used as a tool to continue to extract on the end of the Nama people, which was which was expropriated with the stroke of a royal pen in Germany. The Imperial Kaiser made a unanimous decision that he's going to take all the land of all the Nama and the Ovaherero people and on that same land, the same Germany today, 100 and whatever years later, the same German government is facilitating a process of extracting energy for export to Germany without addressing the fact that that land was lost. So yeah, these, these are the things that we, we need to look at. We, um, we need to see human beings. This, you know, uh, uh, are we, are, are, are people against whom violences, different forms of violences are committed, are they seen as subjects of law? Or are they merely seen as objects of extracting? That is, that is what we are dealing with, yeah. Thank you, dear Sima. Um, I'm just seeing also that we are having four minutes left, but the discussion is so heated that I have to ask if we can um, have more 10 more minutes. Um, interpreters, would this be okay? I'm not hearing anything. Okay, yeah, okay, good, super. Um, yes, great. Um, I, because especially because of the words of Sima now at the end. Um, we have more questions. We have more uh, people who would like to um, to to enter also the fishbowl. Uh, I have also two comments, um, just very briefly, because um, the which I think is really interesting that in German, in the German language, the word Schuld, so guilt, and Schulden, so debt, is uh, are very near to each other. And when we see actually um, how, uh, and I want to get also to the debt question here because I think it's also a coloniality, a form of colonial and um, um, yeah, fiscal uh, way of uh, controlling as. Um, yeah, our the late Thomas Sankara uh, elaborated often um, that 
how also the question like who is being saved here when we're speaking about the climate crisis the climate change and so on and so forth as if it is a storm in which we are all in um a storm in which we are all in yes but not in the same boat unfortunately unfortunately and um who is being saved here because this is the, the lingo, right, of we have to save our planets, we have to save each other, and so on and so forth. But um, yeah, who, who's actually being saved and how depth is also a part of that. Um, and another maybe wordplay as well, the question of remembering and remembering. So again, being a member of the world um, and how these two uh, are very inter intertwined. Um, at the same time, the question of subjects, as Sima has also made clear, and um, of rights. And in which world do we actually want to live in? And can aid be a part of that at the end of the day? Um, is aid part of the remembering, be, again, being a member of, of, of a good world, uh, or a world in which everyone has a good life and enjoys a good life? So um, I have two, we have two questions in the fishbowl. Yes, two contributions. So. Yes, Denise. Yes, we do. Uh, and we're going to see Ute again, who was briefly on the panel before. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much that you're taking my question. Um, I have a question, I think, mainly addressed to Sima, but to the others as well. Um, the question of reparations versus aid in, in the German context is a very diverse one. I mean, we have the forced labor in the Second World War. We have uh, the Greeks asking for reparations um, related to the Second World War. Um, and it's, it's always the same thing that comes up. So I agree that um, the question of reparations is, is a very important one. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Sima, if we if we are assuming that we're moving from aid to reparations, I mean, what would it actually mean? What kind of impulses would it send to existing power structures? I mean, on which level would it change, uh, challenge uh, existing power struggles? Like on the global, we have the bilateral that you mentioned, but we also have national and, and local levels. I'd be interested to hear what, what you see, what could be rippling effects if, if we're actually um, manage to to get to reparations in in this specific case thanks very much thank you the Ute. um maybe we gather a bit of questions because now we are in the last 10 minutes um and then go again in a round of answers all these questions i mean you can also you can also just comment right you can also put in a perspective that we don't see or we um didn't mention so denise yes uh then i would like uh pearl to uh come on our panel yes hi everyone um thanks so much for giving me the space to say something um first of all i'd like to thank the um people hosting this and the guests for like all the input for this topic it really uh, made me think about many many things and many um, solutions we should consider more often. Um, one thing I wanted to ask and talk about though is um, the question of short-term versus long-term aid. Um, I fully agree with um, there no being development aid without um, really working through the past, without thinking about reparations. There's no, um, I think, conversation on um, the same eye level without really um, dealing with the history um, but then when we're looking at short-term issues and for example let's say the the current um, hunger crisis in Somalia um, where people at the end of the day obviously I mean that crisis is due to climate change and people not being able to um, grow any crops or um, actually grow enough food and we all know what climate, I mean, who caused climate change. So like we know what is the root cause of this issue, but then the people um, uh, who are currently very deeply affected by the hunger crisis there and who also were depending on import from Ukraine and Russia of weed, which has been, uh, Syria, which has been obviously now stopped. Um, they are in very deep need for um, aid. 
when it comes to really like short term um, projects. And I was wondering whether you would agree or whether you would add anything else to this or have a completely different answer. Um, should short term aid and long and long term um, processes of decolonization go hand in hand? Because I think we need both. I think we can't really. Um, I think we cannot really help people on the ground who are living in a crisis and have zero food. And at the same time, we can like talk about decolonizing the system and talking about how development aid should look on the long run. So I'm hoping we can do both. Um, yeah, but I'm interested in your perspective, um, especially Lian and, and Seema, what you might say to this. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this is also an important aspect uh, to see the geopolitical changes as well that are happening. We are we will talk about the geopolitics of aid in the fourth um, uh, uh, session. But now uh, again to Denise, we have. I mean, you, uh, your question will be also answered, of course. Um, but now Denise will pose in two more questions and then uh, Lian, uh, Sima, Tanya, you will have uh, the possibility to answer and then I will wrap up for our next session. Uh, yes, we have a few thousand questions in the uh, chat, but uh, I selected uh, two of them that I think are very well for this final moments of the session today. Um, Antje is asking, um, and I think this question is directed at everyone here and will uh, not be answered, uh, answered definitely today, but maybe we can give some glimpse as a kind of preview for the rest of the series. Um, she asks, how do we change aid into something solidaric, something decolonial that helps build sovereignty without causing harm to the people who receive and need help? She mentions financially, especially right now. And then Yesko adds something to it, who's writing from the Syrian border, he says. And he says, um, yes, um, there are political interests behind funds and everything, but he would rather use them to aid than not being able to do something at all. Yeah, thank you very much for again sharpening the dilemma of um of aid and its architecture. Um Tima, Lian, Tanya, you have the floor for answering the questions and concluding. So Sima, would you like to start? Sure, I can start. Thank you. Um yeah, you know, <laughs> um for me I you know, it's um, the 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 question was about um, what would be the repercussions of reparations. I think the same question can be asked: um, What are the repercussions of continued aid? You know, <laughs> the same question can be asked because you are just we are just postponing um, dealing with a problem a problem that is a very real problem. We need to deal with it and definitely aid in the way that it is understood now is not going to solve this problem because um, it is aid as it is now um, is about power that privileges whiteness. And it is an imposition of the concept of modernity using development to sort of approximate the colonies to European modernity and the creation of financial systems that in, enrich the few at the expense of many. And I think the events in Namibia have reaffirmed, um, you know, that, that this is the situation and that it is only sort of, you know, you, we need to deconstruct the entire system and the longer we wait, the more we are going to be in trouble. So, yeah, that is that is what I can say in, in, in conclusion. We need to deal with the problem. And also I want to I want to emphasize that, you know. Uh Dear Sima, I think you are muted. 
Okay, now you are unmuted. Are you speaking? Maybe you can write in the chat. Yeah, I, I think also um, in the specific case of Namibia, um, we are not only talking about colonialism, but we are also talking about genocide. And, 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 the, and there's, a, there's a very big difference between the two. In, 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 in genocide, there is an intent to exterminate people as a collective. That is the intent of, ex the intent is to exterminate so that they don't exist anymore as a people. They must be completely destroyed. That is the intent of genocide. And so, and this is where in the case of Namibia, repairing that damage becomes so critical that you cannot only talk about Namibia, you know, within the colonial context, but that you have to talk about it within the genocide context. I think that is something um, that is also important to, to remember. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, Radua, I need to, I have to um, log on to another meeting <laughs> that is starting now in, in five minutes. Yeah, I just wanted to give those concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Drisima. Thank you for being here and for coming and for your very important uh, points and um, insights. And yeah, we will continue this discussion. This is just the beginning. So thank you very much. And I wish you a good further meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you thank for you. having me. And thank you to all the hosts and to the technical people and to the audience that has attended. Thank you very much. And yeah, we look forward to having the discussions continued. Thank you very much. Julian, you have the floor. Ya, <clears throat> terima kasih banyak untuk uh, beberapa pertanyaan yang sudah disampaikan baik melalui chat, tapi yes, saya thank you very much. sangat uh, menikmati I would like to get back to the questions from the chat and the questions that you asked orally. But first, I would like to thank everyone who was involved in the discussion. Thank you very much for your remarks and your comments. Well, my final statement is that it is very important to be careful, to always observe the situation, to always question the concepts of aid and development. That means that the systems that have already been created should also be analyzed with a specific level of mistrust. We need to question the concept, we need to analyze the concepts, and we need to check whether they are fitting to the societies and the communities where they are supposed to be implemented. And also environmental and nature programs um, also need to be analyzed accordingly. And also anti-terrorism programs and humanitarian programs need to be observed and considered in that regard. So everything that is connected to society, we need to be critical about whether the objectives and the mechanisms are fitting to the context of the society. So we need to be very critical, we need to be questioning, and as I already said, we need to create spaces where the voices of the affected people and communities are being heard. And we need to develop new methods in order to replace the existing methods, to renew the methods. And I hope that in the future we will develop processes in order to analyze the situation. And these processes should also be especially aligned to involving the local community. And the processes also always need to consider the implementation 
of things and also in terms of peace development. There are some theories that are being shared with the local communities and we need to actually question whether these mechanisms are fitting. So we need to analyze all these processes and mechanisms. We need to see whether the mechanisms fit to the aid and all the tools that are available and that have been provided. So you always need to consider the context in which aid is being, deplo uh, aid is being deployed and implemented. So we need to be more critical. That means we need to make sure that the community is the basis for everything, also for the aid. If we consider aid, if we consider development aid, we also need to hear the voices of the people who are affected. This is so important and in the future this also needs to play the major role in order to actually achieve the changes that we want to achieve. And also, we also need to do that together with politics. Thank you very much, dear Lian. Um, yeah, Tanya, you have the floor, but please uh, be brief as possible because we are already over time. I think a lot has already been said, so I will be very brief. I don't think that there can be a process from aid to reparations. So if we need future aid, this needs to be based on reparations and restitution. So aid has to be part of the historical analysis. Aid needs to be based on history. There is no sound again. So I think we cannot change aid into restitution or reparation, but we always need to base everything on the history. And that is why I would like to get back to the question of short or long term aid or emergency aid, aid which is needed right now, especially during the climate crisis. We know that there will be major climate crises in the future and natural disasters. And I think both speakers were able to show that it is necessary to also provide this short term aid. However, this should not be formulated in this development aid policy. So those people receiving aid should not be considered to be victims. They should be the active stakeholders and they should also be addressed that way. They should be included in the mechanisms. This is also what Lian said. The mechanisms of emergency aid need to get all the affected parties on board. They need to involve the local communities. And I think the example from Liam also showed it quite well that it is working. The local communities need to be the stakeholders. They need to be active. They need to be on board. You cannot impose this aid paradigm, but you have to first ask what are the needs the requirements of the local communities and how can we involve the local community to implement aid or yeah how can we construct the relationships so these are the questions that we need to ask and this is also how we can imagine short-term aid disaster relief 
And I think the speakers have already pointed to that. A lot has been said already. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear. Um, yeah, Sima already left us, but um, Lian and Tanya for your very important and your very um, yeah sharp uh, arguments and clear statements. Um, and also, thank you very much to everyone who has uh, joined us today and to everyone um, who posed a question, who um, engaged uh, even only by listening. Um, we will continue this discussion. Um, I think a lot of uh, points uh, already has been made, have been made uh, to see that as Huda uh, um our partner from uh, Idlib, Syria, has said, we don't want to be defined by crisis. And we are not just collateral damage. Um, as our partner, Bartolomeo, from um, UNAC, Mozambique, has also pointed uh, when we visited them. Um, it also has shown there are no universal uh, answers. And um, at the same time, we have to pose the questions uh, in the sharpness and also and uh, in its acuteness. We will meet again on uh, the 11th of December. Yes, 11th of December. Um, and we will discuss further what already has been opened here with the questions of the climate crisis, for example, and the climate uh, injustice um, with uh, the master's garden, green capitalism and its intersection with green neocolonialism. Today we opened the house and tomorrow and next time we will go further and dig, dig deeper in the garden <laughs> um, and more to roots and more to root causes. Um, we will be speaking with Nimo Basse. And until then, dear participants, dear Leon, dear Tania, thank you very much. Have a good have good weeks and we'll see each other on the eleventh of December.